This video is brought to you by Squarespace, the all-in-one platform to build your website and business. More on them a little bit later on. So a few weeks ago, I asked you guys which classic races I should do a comedy review on. And to be frank, I shouldn't have been surprised by the results. I know this news will be disappointing to the many of you who asked for this, but I am not making a comedy review on Imola 1994. <laughs> Bloody hell, you guys are f***ed in the head. That was not a Senna reference, I promise. Anyway, the second most popular suggestion was Canada 2011, a race many refer to as the best of the century, and what I refer to as the craziest race of all time. The YouTube algorithm kind of likes that sort of thing. And as always, if you end up enjoying the video, I do them for all the modern day Grand Prix as well, so be sure to drop the video a like and get subscribed for all of that. Now, with my plugs out the way, let's get into the comedy review for the 2011 Canadian Grand Prix. Before we get started, I want to give a big shout out to Squarespace for sponsoring this video. Squarespace is an online platform which allows you to build your own incredible website, be that for your business, your personal blog, or your Pierre Gasly stand page. Putting together a website can seem like a pretty scary task at first, but Squarespace's builder makes it incredibly easy to set up your page in no time. You'll begin by choosing from their vast array of template options, and once you've done that, you'll be able to go more in depth and tweak any aspect of that you want. I personally really liked how Squarespace's tile system helps you line everything up just how you want it, making it super simple to get a professional and slick result in a matter of minutes. What you do with your website then is completely up to you, though I wouldn't complain if there were a few more FP1 Will fan sites out there. Just a suggestion that. Whatever you decide, Squarespace's in-depth analytics will give you a fantastic overview of your internet traffic, helping you grow your site and reach a larger audience. That can be a really helpful feature if, like me, you're an influencer. I can put all my socials on one space and get more followers across the board, making me even more vain in the process. The best part is you can try this all out for free by heading to squarespace.com and redeeming your 14-day trial. And once you're set up and ready to go, head over to squarespace.com slash fp1will or use the code on screen to get 10% off your first purchase. So cheers again to Squarespace. Now let's get back to the video. Right then, I think the best place to start will be filling in all you senile fans and senile DTS fans. So let's start by giving you a preview of the 2011 Formula 1 season. It was round 7 of the championship, a championship dominated by a certain Sebastian Vettel. But who was he driving for, you ask? Well, let's ask the Pit Stop podcast. All I knew was Aston Martin <laughs> and Ferrari, and I just guessed yeah, it would have been a third one. Aston Martin, Ferrari, and... Uh, wait, how did we count three and now we can't even think of the third one? Renault. Wait, I can't think of it. I've gone blank. I just had the third one and now I've McLaren. gone completely You McLaren. bleed this team. You bleed this team is what you're oh, talking yeah. about. <laughs> oh, Haas. How did you not get that? Haas, how did metal I? joke from Haas. Are you what? <laughs> okay, maybe maybe not. But um, can I get my free paddock pass now? To clear things up, Vettel was driving for Red Bull and had won all bar one of the opening six rounds of the season. This meant he had a rather large lead of 58 points ahead of the second place man in the championship, McLaren's Lewis Hamilton. The now seven-time champion had only one title to his name at this point and was entering a shaky period in his career which he'll have to cover at some point down the line. He partnered fellow Briton Jensen Button at Woking at a time where McLaren fans weren't all pathetic seven-year-olds scouring eBay for one of Lando Norris's pubic hairs. Also unlike nowadays, McLaren were actually good and were looking to take the fight to Red Bull and Vettel. We might as well also cover Ferrari. They fielded Fernando Alonso and Felipe Massa, who were both pretty irrelevant in this story, I'll be honest. One driver who wouldn't be competing, however, would be Sauber's rookie Sergio Perez, who found out Tokyo drifting into the Monaco Harbour wasn't a particularly good idea. He would be replaced by the driver Sauber told to piss off at the end of the previous season, McLaren reserve Pedro de la Rosa, in what I consider to be his last race in Formula 1. Yes, he competed with HRT in 2012, but they were HRT, so... We'll move on to practice though, and here Canada's famous wall of champions caught out F1's newest and youngest, Sebastian Vettel wiping himself out of the session. That would be the first accident in an incident-prone Friday. Kayumi Kobayashi using World War II tactics on turn four before Jerome D'Ambrosio had a go. Maybe now might be a good idea to check in and see how Pedro De La Rosa's doing. Yeah, can't park there, mate. Ferrari and Mercedes had looked quick over the three practice sessions. However, it was Sebastian Vettel who would set the quickest time come the end of qualifying. Alonso and Massa followed in closely behind as the teams wrapped up Saturday and prepared for the race the next day. But you see, there was a bit of a problem with that. Sunday would bring with it rain, 
And I don't just mean a light shower. Thankfully, we're in an era where both the FIA and Pirelli aren't run by bumbling imbeciles. So with every car on full wet tyres that actually worked, the race got underway at its scheduled 1pm time slot, albeit behind the safety car. After five laps, it was time to actually get started. Vettel leading Alonso down into turn one, while further back, McLaren tried a new way to deal with the Red Bulls when Hamilton slid into the side of Mark Webber. This dropped both drivers back, and the second silver car of Jensen Button wasn't faring much better. He ran wide, falling behind his teammate. Gee, I hope that doesn't end badly. Anyway, Mark Webber would have to fight his way back through the pack, while everyone's favourite Sky Pundit, Paul de Resta, did a Paul de Resta and slipped backwards into irrelevancy. Back at McLaren, Button had managed to make it past Lewis, though the man from Stevenage wasn't quite ready to give in. Unfortunately, Button was, as he slammed both cars into the pit wall. Lewis was out on the spot, with rear suspension damage as Button limped back to the pits to change onto intermediate tyres because the wets were doing such a good job, weren't they? Button's day would then get worse when he was caught speeding under the following safety car, earning him a drive through penalty. And I mean, at this point, you might as well just give up and retire, because there's no way you're coming back from this, right? When the safety car came in, Alonso tried to attack Vettel down into turn one, though the German was able to fend off the Ferrari and build up a gap out front. Those that were switching to the intermediates, however, were beginning to see the fruit of their efforts. That was until the rain came back. It got so bad that the race had to be suspended on lap 26, and it would be two hours of listening to the commentators try and fill time before the Grand Prix could resume. The only solace in that was that David Croft wasn't around yet. Welcome along to what's going to be a very special day. The red flag occurring when it did had caused chaos to the running order. Vettel still led, but Kobayashi was now second, from Massa, Nick Heidfeld, Vitaly Petrov, and De Resta. Yeah, I don't know how that happened either. This also put Button back into the top 10 and gave him a fighting chance to get back to the front of the pack. What did he do with that chance, you ask? Well, he punted off Alonso. Well done, Jensen. The only driver who looked like he could challenge Vettel was now in the wall and out of the race. Button, meanwhile, got back to the pits with a puncture but was now 21st and last. Should have just taken my advice to give up, to be honest, shouldn't he? Incredibly, the drivers were coping well despite the torrential conditions. Well, apart from Paul DeResta, but be real, who actually cares? Formula 1 works in strange ways, though, when it was only once the track began to dry and the drivers headed in for slicks that they seemingly forgot how to f***ing drive. Adrian Sutil was first to fall with accident damage on lap 53. Felipe Massa proved he couldn't even lap an HRT. Then Nick Heifel would ram Kobayashi up the arse before driving over his own front wing and straight into retirement. That incident would bring out safety car number 6 of the day, and if you thought the marshals were stupid at the 2022 Japanese Grand Prix, well, meet the man who decided he would try to slide tackle a Formula One car. God, if F1 Twitter was about in those days, I dread to think. Back at the front, Vettel was still storming away in the lead, with a battle for second between Michael Schumacher, Mark Webber, and Jensen Button. Where the f*** has he come from? Jensen, despite being last at two points in the Grand Prix, had timed his stop onto dry tyres perfectly, and using his wet weather driving skills, had managed to quickly side his way through the pack. He now had two of the best races in these conditions to contend with, however. Red Bull's Mark Webber and seven-time world champion Michael Schumacher. They might as well have been Latifi and Mazepin, however. Jensen making short work of Mark when he made a mistake into the final corner, and one lap later, the McLaren driver sailed past Michael thanks to the use of DRS. Only Sebastian Vettel lay ahead. He had driven the perfect race, though thanks to all the safety cars, was only four seconds clear of Button with five laps to go. So Jensen went to work. By the final lap, Button was on Seb's tail, but it would be a tall order to make the move before the chequered flag. Thankfully for the Briton, Vettel decided to interview for Ferrari in the middle sector, conducting one of the biggest bottle jobs in F1 history as he slid wide and allowed Jensen into the lead. Somehow, the Briton had managed it. He'd taken out his own teammates, sped under the safety car, wiped out Alonso, pitted five times, and still managed to bring his car from last to first to take victory on the final lap. We will never see a race like it again. It will forever hold the record as the World Championship's longest race clocking in at over four hours at the end of the day. Jensen would end up going on to be Vettel's closest rival in the 2011 championship, but in reality, he never had a chance. Seb finished off the podium only twice all year, building up that consistency to take his second championship with four races to go. Kind of sounds familiar when you think about it.
Anyway, if you enjoyed the video, be sure to drop it a like and get subscribed. We're aiming for 60,000 subscribers by the end of the year, so if you haven't clicked on that big red button yet, I'd really appreciate you helping me out. And also, let me know what other classic races you want me to cover down in the comments. Again, I am not doing Imola 1994. Thanks to Squarespace for sponsoring this video, and thanks to my patrons who are supporting the work I do. If you want to check out any of that, the links to all of it are down in the description below. Anyway, that's all from me. I'll see you soon with another video, but until then, have a good one.